I want to start with a question that made me sit up and pay attention when it was asked of me. And Tim, a retired contractor from Wisconsin, left a message for me to call him back. Tim's question, is Strong Towns a cult? That's a very good question. It is a really important question because, uh, as you know, uh, it, it can be quite dangerous to your bank account as well as to your life, as well as to your marriage, often to join a cult and your reputation. And, and Tim asked the question, and so I was like, oh, I really want to have this conversation with him. And I called him up, and he said, look, I've been a builder for, I think it had been 60 years that he'd been working as a private contractor, first working for his dad, then building properties himself, building various sheds, building various things. And he said, I've been seeing changes that alarm me in the way that we're going about building the places that we live in. He said, I, I compare what I built with what my son is building now. He said, my son, who took over the business, he said, all of his projects are publicly financed. Most of them are paid through, through public bonds. And the scale is always oversized. That is, they're building buildings as if uh, they will be fit to serve the next 80 years. Uh, a giant uh, sports and recreation centers, all of these types of things. And his question was, I've never understood how this is possible. How did we suddenly move into this world of, of hypersized growth? Uh, and his strong towns occult was his follow-up because he said, I started listening to the podcast and I, I heard Chuck and I heard others saying things that I've been saying all along. I've been raising these questions. I've been asking, how, how have we gotten to this point? How, how can we uh, manage uh, to afford uh, the situation that we find ourselves in? Tim said, you know, this is what I built. I, I built sheds uh, for farmers uh, that used very scarce resources but used them very effectively. I built things for commercial lenders uh, and commercial owners uh, so that way they could build wealth in a place. Again, using scarce resources very effectively, building to the size and speed and scale of a person on foot, being able to build wealth within a community, being integrated into these communities and not set apart from them. He said he built municipal structures. Municipal structures, again, mirroring what the private realm was doing, what farmers had to do. He said, the local municipality would bring me in for a water plant, and I would be building structures like this. I would be building modest infrastructure that used scarce resources wisely, even if they were public resources. He said, my son builds stuff as if the cost doesn't matter. The cost is already paid for through debt. Here we have the challenge uh, that he said, something is changing. He said, I built public resources, but they were still often financed through people sharing from their wealth, providing to the community, uh, patrons lining up to make sure that we could afford uh, what we were building, and using public investment to build wealth and to create prosperity within the community. And so Tim's contention is that we have lost sight of what it takes to build enduring prosperity. And I don't think he's wrong, and I don't think he's being grumpy. And I don't think that he is simply one person having this view and finding one other person that is holding this view. A Tim's view, along with a view of many, is that everything from how we fail to adequately, adequately design street fronts uh, to how we allowed land to be gobbled up with wasteful development practices, uh, from how we subsidize the suburbs to the ways that we hamstring our small and local businesses, uh, from the ways that we bend over backwards to attract outside capital, but then have cut off the first several rungs of the small business ladder or the small local housing ladder and the local options that are needed uh, to create prosperity within a place. What he's contended is that we have lost sight of what it takes to build enduring prosperity. Uh, Tim wasn't joining a cult, trust me, which I know doesn't ever work to say trust me when uh, you're assuring someone that you're not a cult, uh, but there was something critical that he was putting his finger on. Why isn't anyone talking about this? And why did he feel such a sense of relief when he emerged to realize there's others that are taking up this question, contemplating the significant difference in the way that we develop communities today compared to the way that we did it in the past? And so, Strong Towns is that organization that is helping to lead this conversation. This is what we are talking about. This is what people are listening to. Uh, and this week is our member drive, and we're seeing hundreds more people uh, participating in a now global movement uh, to reshape the pattern of development that is affecting all of us. It's here, and it's also all over the world. 
And so I have the privilege of working uh, with an amazing group of team members at Strong Towns. Uh, I'm the member advocate for Strong Towns, and my role is to learn from our members about the struggles they're facing. I heard struggles shared last night and this morning, and I can tell you those are the same struggles that our Strong Towns members are facing in their communities, in Hawaii, in, in Australia, in Ireland, in, in states across North, uh, the United States, as well as provinces across Canada. I'm learning of the opportunities that they've carved out for themselves and the tools that, and resources they want to share with others. And so I'm here before you as an enthusiast, not an expert, uh, but I hope you'll hear the threads of wise counsel and sound analysis by others uh, in what I share with you today. And these are not my ideas, uh, but they are ones that struck me much the same way that they struck Tim, as a way of seeing the world that rang true and scratched at that nagging itch that has emerged because of the way we've been building cities and towns. I grew up on a dairy farm outside of Coaldale. Uh, we ran Eden's Holstings. My parents immigrated from the Netherlands and started a farm uh, several years later. Very modest means. I saw firsthand the challenges uh, and the need to live within our means, uh, to not, as, as it were, eat all our grain unless we have nothing to sow with the next season. As a farmer, my dad had to conserve, to reserve, to preserve the key resources we needed to survive. And so I guess I have a question for you. Do you have the feeling that your city struggles to do this? And if so, you're not alone. Lethbridge, Coaldale, Tabor, Airdrie, Calgary, Regina, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, these places are struggling to keep up. And here's the difficulty. Our current path, meant as a means of securing prosperity for all, has unwittingly trapped us in a system uh, that is incapable of building lasting prosperity. And I'm just going to scratch the surface of this analysis, uh, but this path is leading us to ruin. On the one hand, it's a moral ruin, where we realize that we are wasting our grandchildren's opportunity to create wealth for themselves because we saddled them with debts onto them uh, that we pushed onto them so we could have nice things cheaply right now. It's also a social ruin when we struggle to keep schools, libraries, pools, and other community services open and financially solvent. It's a financial ruin when insolvency comes for pensions and core city services. It's an environmental ruin when we so degrade the natural world around us that it struggles to provide us with the riches we have sought from it all these years. But lest you think that you are in fact in a doomsday cult, I want to speak with you about the promise. Uh, there is a local path. It's not all doom and gloom. There is a local path to gradually restore the capacity to create and sustain local prosperity. Strong Towns is about slow, incremental progress towards a greater vision of prospering places that know what it takes to conserve scarce resources, but also to use them in the most effective ways. I've had people ask, uh, what's changed in Medicine Hat? And at this point, at this part of the process, the conversations are changing, uh, the analysis is changing, uh, the ways in which people are, are grappling with these things, the, the decisions they're making with a Wednesday afternoon is changing. But in time, you'll begin to see as this flywheel picks up a process of renewing communities that makes them stronger in a ton of ways. And that's what we're going to be talking about. This is why Strong Towns is here. Uh, this is why the mayor and members of city council have been so passionate about this project. Uh, this is why we are talking about this today. And I'll save time towards the end uh, for an extended Q&A time. I don't have a flight to catch until 545, so I've got plenty of time. Um, but as we go through, I want to show that we have this local path uh, to gradually nurture an ecosystem uh, that builds and sustains prosperity. And for all of you who are looking for a takeaway, uh, it is this. It's an encouragement to familiarize yourself with the traditional development pattern. Look around you, and you will see that the way that we develop communities today, when we do full-scale developments of, of entire neighborhoods all at once, that that is very different from the way that we used to build communities. There was an interesting observation in the city of Medicine Hat's analysis of real estate in the neighborhoods. 
And they, they observed the way that uh, as Madison Hat has grown, uh, they were examining where have the building permits been taken out. And you can kind of see, first you have building permits in the core area, then the adding neighborhoods around it. So you get building permits in that decade. And then the next decade, and they had color coded it by decade. And so as you see, you begin to see these rings. And that's very normal in the traditional development pattern. But then they were kind of confused because what they were also seeing is that within the core of the neighborhoods, I mean the core of the city, right near the downtown and the adjacent areas, uh, all of the colors kept popping up. It was like, it was like confetti popping up within uh, the core area because these were the neighborhoods that were permitted to still evolve, to still mature, whereas the remainder of them have not changed in any significant way. And only now, as greater challenges are emerging, are we beginning to see some of that renovation and renewal of the ecosystem that builds and sustains prosperity for all. And I'll touch a little bit on, on why the downtown and why this local place matters so much. Uh, but we know that the traditional pattern of development, which is observable in cities and towns, large and small, over centuries and millennia of human habitat creation, is a sound base and guide for us. And we need to learn the art of building communities from our ancestors again. The people who lived before the iPhone have a lot to teach us. The people who lived before the automobile have a lot to teach us. The people who lived before steam, before we had various schemes and methods of, of centralized banking, before all that, we have so much to learn from them if we have the humility to do so. To learn how to conserve scarce resources or else your community dies out. To learn how to build sustained prosperity so that you leave not only a legacy for yourself but also for the future. Uh, to be aware that many times we must be comfortable with enough and live within our means. In this afternoon, I want to lay out three core areas that I trust you'll find to be of value. Uh, the first is to ask, what have we done? What have we done? And then to discern, what do we do? And finally, to determine uh, what can change first. And we have traded, in the first place, what have we done? We have traded a robust incremental approach to growing. Uh, the traditional development pattern visible in the layout of downtown Medicine Hat and its adjacent neighborhoods. And we've traded that for a complicated but fragile pattern of suburban style development. And to help us, I want to think about uh, the notion of a complex adaptive system. And so for those that attended the session with Chuck Marone in February, January, when he was here, uh, this was part of his speech there. And so we're, we're going to speed right through it. Uh, for some of you, if you didn't attend that, I, I'll try to make it so you understand uh, why this is significant. And, and as we talk about a traditional development pattern, I want to understand this in the sense of it being part of a complex adaptive system. When we look at a rainforest, uh, we recognize that it has a certain order to it. Uh, but that order emerges. That order is not imposed. Uh, it isn't that the ferns have a discussion one day, let's master plan the forest and make sure that we have sufficient space for our fronds. No, it works. It emerges. Uh, cr different plants, critters, animals, uh, both above the ground and, as we're increasingly learning, below the ground have an, a critical, important role to play. Often to the point where when you do a simple analysis of a rainforest, you, you don't even fully capture the majesty of what's happening there, the complex adapt adaptations that occur uh, within these places. And we often have trouble thinking about human habitat this way, but, but historical cities, historical settlements, small communities, places where people cluster together uh, have these features, are complex and adapted over time. We often struggle to see this because we look at a city like uh, Barcelona, for example. We say, well, Barcelona has, has this structure to it, and, and that must have been because of somebody's brilliance. But the reality is it emerged out of a whole host of different decision-making practices. Uh, people go to Rome, and they're, they're freaked out because they're like, I don't know where I'm going. But, but somehow the city works. Somehow there's a capacity for human flourishing to exist here in cities that have stood the test of time. And it was mostly organic. It grew out of the environment. And, and complex adaptive systems are different than the system that we have settled for today, which is a complicated system. I think of a Rube Goldberg machine. The way that we build our suburbs and the way that we build our big box stores and the way that we uh, develop on the edges of our communities while neglecting the core of our community is, is much, uh, following much the same model as a Rube Goldberg machine. If we, if we get all the inputs right, get the financing in just at the right moment, uh, then we can produce basically the same product over and over and over again. 
But what happens with the Rube Goldberg machine if you take out one of those blocks? It doesn't improve, it doesn't become a book, it just breaks. It doesn't adapt, it doesn't uh, take on new characteristics, it just fails. And this is the difference between systems that are complex and systems that are complicated. Complex systems have this internal capacity to adapt and to evolve, to change, uh, to respond to stresses and opportunities, and critically, to take on local characteristics. This is the thing that is quite striking in, in the city where I live, that, that our older neighborhoods have these local characteristics, but so much of what we've recently built lacks that quality and could be interchanged with Spokane, could be interchanged with Regina, could be interchanged with uh, Waterloo. And here we are. We've created a system that has lost the capacity to adapt and to evolve. And, and so we see the, this happening in human habitat. Do we want something that is simply orderly, structured, follows a plan, follows it to the T? Or do we need these types of systems that, that may be kind of messy, may be somewhat chaotic, and yet have the capacity uh, to create real opportunity, opportunities where they previously didn't exist? Go to some of these older uh, uh, centers, especially if you head out east, uh, eastern, the eastern seaboard or eastern Canada, uh, go to Quebec City, and there you see all of these little alleyways, and, and somebody's tucked in a little store. Our suburban zoning codes don't allow that. Uh, we have all sorts of adaptive uses of, of backyards and back alleys, and yet we, and so often, and see this in my community, in Calgary, and Lethbridge, all of these places have, have, have lost that capacity, and we need to regain it. One of the challenges is that policy, subsidies, uh, a flurry of construction resulted in a dramatically simplified method of building out cities. The housing model we've grown accustomed to, a model Strong Towns describes as the suburban experiment, is a model that is very efficient at replicating itself, but is, in the long scope of human history, very distinct, very untested, very untried, still in its experimental stage after just eight decades. And the data coming back on this experiment is not promising. And so I know you didn't come here for a housing lecture, um, but if we go back and we look at older cities, I want to point this out uh, in the city of uh, Grand Rapids. Uh, this is in Michigan. Uh, but I would say this is an illustration of a development pattern in what could be Lethbridge, uh, could be Calgary, could be Medicine Hat, but it's, it's Medicine or Grand Rapids. I was there for a speech a while ago. And you can see elements of the traditional development pattern here found in almost all cities built before the automobile. It's a high, deeply resilient, highly financially productive, nearly foolproof way to design a city. Notice the size, or the mix of sizes and uses in this scene. Different types of buildings, different types of clusters, different types of layouts. And, and three features in particular to highlight. The complexity of it. This is clearly not the product of one architect or of one builder. It's the product of many minds, and that's its mastery. That makes it work. It's the product of thousands of minds, hands, and strong backs, all participating in that project, all reaping its benefits, all participating in what comes next. Notice also the lot coverage. Many, if not most, of the buildings are built to the property line, uh, built uh, because you bought it. Property rights is such a, a, a core value that many of us hold to, and we want to guard the things that we own. And so if you've bought it, you should be able to use it, including the land that we're on. And, and even more critically, what you do is you bring your building to the street for access to what the street offers, particularly if you're running a shop or running some other retail service or some uh, provision that needs people to come uh, to your space. And then third, uh, you can also see here, uh, down towards the bottom, the different adaptations. So notice that bottom structure. And an architect would probably lose their mind over that. It ain't pretty. But that's what we had on our farm. My dad, when we needed to expand things, would add to it. And, and it wasn't always beautiful. It was somewhat chaotic. But, but it was critically something we could do within our means. And this is what you see in community after community all over the place. And so here we have... Uh, this merging of two structures together with this inelegant, messy addition, but this is what the next increment of development often looks like. And so that was Grand Rapids. You say, oh, that's a long ways away. Why are you talking about Michigan? Uh, but I want you to spot the similarities with downtown Medicine Hat, uh, which could benefit from street trees being, more street trees being planted in the public rights of way, would really benefit from the reintroduction of even more housing integrated into the urban fabric of the downtown. 
uh, to bring about uh, a greater prosperity within the downtown. But here's Medicine Hat's downtown. And notice again the key features of this traditional development pattern. There's complexity. Not everything looks the same. In fact, it's remarkably weird and wonderful. Uh, there's lot coverage. You're using scarce land and using it effectively in a way that amplifies the capacity of the community to provide for its needs. And you can see evidence of incremental growth and adaptation. Uh, little, dip, little patios on roofs, uh, little structures that are going to be elevated into larger structures, uh, the yard where we were last night, different spaces uh, for different uh, types of needs. But what have we done? What have we done? We've traded a viable but incremental approach for an approach that suits what we call the growth machine. Uh, the growth machine. Uh, the growth machine promises immediate returns uh, through persistent growth, following the approach that uh, we call the quantum theory of economic development. A quantum theory is the idea that there's kind of strange things out there in, phys in the world of physics, and, and it's almost not really capable of being understood, but we can just observe what's happening and, and draw conclusions from what's going on with that. Uh, that's about all that I know about quantum theory, trust me. But the quantum theory of economic development goes something like this. We do a project over here that we know makes no financial sense. Then we do a project over here that makes no financial sense. And then we do one here. And then we claim you can't measure in them individually. You just have to trust that collectively, when they're put together, bad projects cause great things to happen. That's essentially the quantum theory behind economic development today. You can't measure it because it changes once you do. So, so what we said is, OK, if that's true, there are still parts of the system that we should be able to go out and measure. People say, oh, the city is just too complicated to get a full picture of its financial perspective. All right, let's, let's narrow it down. Let's look at, at very specific blocks or parcels. And, and again, this is, uh, was shared in January, but I want to share this again because it makes uh, the point very well. Uh, we analyzed uh, a dead-end road with a cul-de-sac. That road only exists so that the people living in those homes as well as their guests, as well as the Amazon delivery van, is able to use that space to access those homes. There's no through traffic. There's no commercial traffic. It only exists to serve those homes. And so if those homes didn't exist or if they were elsewhere, that road would not be there. And so this was built in the 1990s in Minnesota. And when it was constructed, the city said, we can't settle for a dirt lane or a gravel road. Uh, that, that's beneath us. That doesn't meet our standard. So we want it paved. And we'll simply ask the property owners to make sure that it gets paid. And they will pay half the cost, and the city will pay the other half. And we analyzed the amount of revenue uh, that this produced that was coming to the city from these properties. And you say, OK, we've got one parcel, a bunch of people living here. They're all paying property taxes. Surely that must pay for itself. The city's better off, right? But when we analyzed it, we asked the question, how long will it take just to recoup the cost of the construction project? And the answer was 37 years based on just the increase in tax value coming to the city because these properties existed. Now, that's 37 years for just half of the amount because the city only had to pay half of that first time. But the road won't last for 37 years. And when the city goes out to fix it, the city will have to pay the full cost because the private owners are going to say, no, 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 that's your responsibility now. Uh, the taxpayers pay money every year for the city to maintain that roadway, and they won't be interested in paying 50% up front again. And here's what we're seeing. Here's another development, a closed-loop system with a dead-end cul-de-sac. Uh, no through traffic, no commercial traffic. So it allows us to study just this area and say it's not that it's serving as a trade corridor. It's not that the, the Boy Scouts need to pass through that area in order to get to where they're going. And so it has to exist for other reasons. No, it only exists to serve these homes. And again, this time, the developer paid for all the costs, uh, which is one of the things that we expect most of our developments uh, to have happen. And that money was rolled over into the sale of the properties. People have been paying down the cost for all of the infrastructure through their mortgages. The developer got the money that they put into the project. And now the people are, through their mortgages, paying down the cost of the road and then paying the taxes to the city. So there should be extra money because the city is now generating additional revenue, having not had to pay for any of this. Well, the road fell apart, and the city went out and fixed it, and the cost was 354000 And based on the revenue that the city was collecting from the property owners that lived there, how long would it take to recoup that cost? The answer was 79 years. A larger development 
with larger lots, not using the scarce resources effectively? And, and the answer is 79 years to recoup that cost, but the road won't last anywhere near that long. That's why if the city wanted to, between now and when the roadway fell apart, collect enough money from these property owners to go out and fix that road, what would that mean? For them, it would be an immediate increase of 46% in taxes with a 3% annual increase for inflation. Ain't nobody going to do that. They're going to throw out the bums that are telling them this, but they're still going to be faced with the problem that the city has committed it uh, to all of these additional costs that they will have to pay for until they decide either we turn the road back into just a gravel lane, and there are communities that are having to do this when they reach the end of their spending, when they reach the end of what they have available, they're saying, we're having to depave some of our roads, we're having to downgrade some of the services, but people in Medicine Hat don't want that. Not many people do. Now you might be wondering, well, we lose money on, on residential, but we make it up in residential and commercial, uh, where our businesses are, where our production is. And our response is, show us one corporation uh, that loses money on 90% of what it does and tries to make it up on the last 10%. A nonprofit trying to do that, any kind of a group. Yeah, yeah, we'll take a haircut on 90%, but we'll make it up on 10%. You're not going to be in business very long. You're going to struggle. And an incorporated municipality should not be finding this to be a good business strategy either. Nevertheless, we've, we've somewhat convinced ourselves that if we just have enough commercial and industrial, it doesn't matter what happens. And so this is a business park uh, in Minnesota. Again, uh, it was a build it and they will come type of project uh, where they had built out a project and, and then they occupied every single lot within uh, that industrial park. And so they felt it was a great success and they wanted to build the exact same thing on property they owned uh, next door. Now here uh, in Canada, it's much more frequent that the developer will say, we are going to build it and then we are gonna find the tenants for it. But even still, the, the lingering longer term impacts really are essentially the same. But in this case, they wanted to build exactly what they had built and build it a second time. And so if we can do the exact same thing, they thought for the exact same amount of money and get the exact same amount of investment, would this be a good product for us? Uh, we want companies to invest in our community, bring jobs, and we'll do that by, by pre-building these types of structures and places for them. Uh, this would cost them $2.1 million to build this for the municipality, which is a steal. Uh, those numbers from a few years ago. Uh, but by their calculation of what could be built in the space, they figured we will get an additional $6.6 .6 million in private investment. Uh, the chicken finger plant that moves in there is going to provide several million dollars. And, and, and the, the school bus uh, manufacturing company is, is going to provide a bit more. And, and somebody that brews craft beer is going to provide even more. They're going to invest in it. So, so now we're going to have this opportunity to build wealth. Well, here was the immediate issue. And this is actually very common. I, I'm, my family now lives in Lethbridge. And so we see this in the industrial areas, that industrial areas, though preserved and intended to be chiefly for industrial purposes, uh, strong economic bases, many of them are occupied by non-taxpaying uses. Uh, in this issue, in this instance, four of the lots became churches. Churches didn't have suitable spaces, so they said, oh, we can go get something here. But they paid zero property tax. Oh, okay, we're taking a haircut on this. Two of the parcels belonged to the school district for their bus maintenance facility because, again, the city had made it available, and they said, why don't we put a few of our services on here? So the two bus facilities. Uh, another city maintenance garage. It had to go somewhere. Very important public facilities. We need churches, schools, and maintenance buildings. But the trouble was that the city realized they were not getting any taxes from these parcels. And so the remaining blocks were the only ones that were contributing to the tax base. The ones that theoretically would be private sector taxpayers, every single one of them was not going to be able to contribute enough to pay this off. For the sake of our analysis, uh, we assume that every single lot would be built within 12 months of this project being completed by full taxpaying non-subsidized entities, which is not what happened, but we assume that even every penny from new revenue uh, would go towards retiring the bond taken to finance this project. And it would still take almost three decades uh, just to break even. That's 29 years where everyone else's taxes would have to go to pay to plow the snow, mow the grass, maintain the streets, and provide police and fire protection and every other service needed. Three different parcels that we've seen. These are the projects that Tim 
the builder from Wisconsin, and many others are questioning. This is the type of approach to large lot development in this way where the city takes on new obligations and ongoing liabilities that Tim and many others have said, we ought not to be sacrificing our future in this way. We need to get back to creating a prosperous opportunities for everyone. And so let's say that a developer comes to town and offers to develop a piece of property, says, I'll, I'll, I'm not asking for any subsidies, I'm gonna build it all, all at my expense. And we will simply be the beneficiaries of this new productive area for the community. We'd say, oh, that sounds great. But the trouble is, you'd have to ask, will it pay for itself? Will it generate sufficient revenue uh, for us uh, to be able to get the things that we need out of it? Because the challenge is that we are faced with some very powerful incentives. Uh, smoking feels great, but here comes emphysema several years later or decades later. Uh, that bowl of ice cream, yeah, it's better than exercise, but here comes heart disease later. And the trouble that we face is that we often uh, take great delight in immediate benefits and lose sight of longer term liabilities. And this is part of why we say strong towns are financially solvent. Strong towns are preparing for the future and strong towns assure that they're not spending every dollar that they have or sacrificing their opportunity to grow by the decisions that they make today. We're wired as humans uh, to temporarily discount future risks because we value positive things today. Banks, governments, creditors, corporations, mega developers, uh, they love those three different types of projects. They're very simple for them. They pencil really easily. The trouble is, our banks, even our governments, don't know what to make of a grandfather that wants to build a workshop with two apartments above it and an irregular alleyway access. The thing that in past decades, past millennia, would be commonplace. You go in with a strange project, or somewhat irregular project, you're gonna wait. Our systems are not allowed in this. We have complicated systems, but they can't handle complexity, even though that complexity is actually the thing that creates so much wealth and opportunity. It's not capable of being commodified and packaged and sold along on the financial markets. Uh, we deem these irregular projects too risky because they're, they're irregular. Look at uh, the way that cities were freaking out over food trucks. Uh, even though they're one of the best pathways uh, to new business ownership in the restaurant industry. But the big players would come in and, and do claim, uh, do this and you'll prosper. Both for big housing tracks developed on uh, former farm fields, but also for the construction of massive public infrastructure projects like ice rinks, hospitals, universities, and the like. For those of you, I, I wasn't around, well, I guess I was a baby when Peter Lougheed was the premier of Alberta, uh, but he had a commitment to put a hospital in every community and a chicken in every pot, uh, to lay out the funds from Edmonton for everyone to receive what they wanted, even if it tanked the province's budget and required the closing of those same hospitals in, in the years that followed, sometimes as little as a decade later having to close them. And here's the question. What did Tim's son, Tim from Wisconsin, what did his son add to the community? You see, this is what's so attractive. He added immediate benefit, and it provided immediate satisfaction. And it was immediately funded by things that would just come due later. And the trouble is that the benefit to the public budget for the new growth was also quite substantial. It, it made a considerable difference, made people feel better about the place that they lived in. But the difficulty is that the catch is that the public agrees to maintain that infrastructure in perpetuity. And so as we look at this, we see some see clear core assumptions. The constant growth is required to stay ahead of the creditors. A Ponzi scheme that calls on us to use new money to pay out older investors because their money is long gone. And either growth continues at ever accelerating rates, which is impossible, or the pattern of development ultimately generates more revenue than it costs to maintain. And this is what Strong Towns is doing as we engage with the city of Medicine Hat. This is what we're doing as we talk with local community partners. Uh, this is what we're encouraging you to take principles from your own practices of family budgeting and household budgeting and business budgeting and say, let's insist on this at the local level. We can't do, we can't do much with what's happening in Ottawa if they turn on the printing machine. My local household does not have that option. So instead, 
We need to ensure that we generate more revenue than the cost to maintain what we have. But cul-de-sacs, business parks, and suburban-style power centers and mismatched clusters of suburban development cannot generate more revenue than it costs to maintain. You may have seen this uh, when Chuck gave this speech, so I'll give a very quick look at what happened in Lafayette, Louisiana. In Lafayette, Louisiana, they had a population of 33,000, and just after the end of Second World War, up to 2015, they'd grown to 120,000. Think, wow, the city had grown by three and a half times. Huge rate of growth. But in order to experience that growth, they had to grow their liabilities by many times more than that. At the end of World War II, it took five feet of pipe per person to provide drinking water for the people of Lafayette. By the mid-2000s, it took 10 times that amount. So the population has increased by 3.5, but the amount of liabilities that they have has increased by 10. And same thing with fire protection. At the end of World War II, 2.4 hydrants per thousand people. And today, or 2015 numbers, it was 21 times that. So deeply, profoundly expanded territory, as well as much higher service levels, but with only a fraction of the increase of population, with the increase of people willing to pay to contribute to these shared services and these shared amenities in the community, as a consequence requiring more from fewer wallets. The amount of stuff that we have in the ground to fix and maintain and take care of has grown exponentially. I see it in Delta. I, I know the chief engineer. He's losing his hair because he said every year we're deferring maintenance on all kinds of major projects. And we're essentially waiting for our dikes to fail when the Fraser River or the Pacific Ocean takes us out. We're waiting for lots of other types of critical infrastructure to fail and we'll rush in at an expensive rate because the contractors are going to flood in uh, at, at emergency rates in order to rebuild what we've broken. I said, why can't we just be fixing what we own? Why can't we be maintaining? And the response from the finance department is we can't. We don't have the funds for this. We don't have the sustainable tax base to allow this. And we've done this to ourselves. We moved from a system that moved ahead through growth to now being a system that moves ahead through debt accumulation. We've needed growth so badly. In terms of implications of this, we've needed growth so badly that we've allowed even our financial system uh, to prey on our friends and our neighbors uh, through private mortgage lending in our financial system. Uh, I'll tell you, this is still the bad news section of it, but I think we're in for a very significant financial reckoning with high levels of household debt, increasing interest rates, and a slowing economy. But even if that's the big picture, what do we have here? Our federal and provincial governments have been stacking up the promises but not able to deliver every project that is needed to keep your city Flood ready, drought ready, fire ready, and functional. Now, the local government is going to be forced to pay for roads to be fixed, pipes to be repaired, and this money has to come from us. And so this can't be done without large tax increases and or large cuts in services. Or we can change our pattern of development. That's a key phrase here. This can't be done in the current pattern of development without either large tax increases, which results in revolution, or large cuts in service, which results in people leaving. But if we begin to modify and change the way that we build our communities, as we change our current pattern of development, as we continue to build with the system, we can improve the place that we live to add lasting prosperity. And so how do we do this? Because at the end of the day, what we're seeing is a complicated system that is not adapting well to changing conditions. And I'm not going to stand and say that I have a silver bullet solution, but we can learn from thousands of years of human habitation of what it takes to build prospering places and communities and learn from these patterns to have an approach that it will help us to get to an answer, to get back to being a complex system. Have you ever taken antibiotics uh, to address medical problems, uh, infections, I guess, would be what you take them for? What does it do to your gut? It just kills everything. Most of the time, it takes out the bacteria, and so you're like, all right. Uh, my parents got really into gut health. Uh, discussions were somewhat gross. But their whole point was we need to recultivate our biomes in our bodies. Uh, if you take antibiotics, you've got to be taking the probiotics to restore that capacity for that work to happen within your system. We need that for our cities. <laughs> Maybe that's a slogan. Strong Towns is, is probiotics uh, for cities' guts. But it's one that allows that work from the bottom up to emerge again, to balance many competing needs. 
we need to deliver an ample amount of housing to people at prices they can actually afford. Not just more housing stock, but more housing choices across a wider spectrum of affordability. And that can only happen from the bottom up. We've tried for 80 years to fix it from the top down, and it's not working. We have a national housing strategy. We have provincial housing strategies. And I can tell you, especially in Vancouver, as, as just a few steps ahead of here, in terms of housing, uh, um, housing prices, all of the provincial and federal investments are not doing anything except juicing the system and making it even worse. Instead, we need to get back to these bottom-up steps that allow local economic e ecosystems that have and are responding to local feedback loops. And so the first one is this universal statement that we have at Strong Towns, that we need to allow the next increment by rights. This is what we see across North America in traditional neighborhoods, and we've stopped doing this ever since World War II. And what I mean by always allowing the next increment by right, uh, there's a little bit of jargon there because the increment is the next intensity of housing. So if there's a house, a duplex should be the next thing that would emerge. Or a triplex uh, to replace a duplex. Or townhouses to come in at lower level density, slowly giving rise to medium height densities. You'll never need six or ten stories here in Medicine Hat if you follow this approach. And people will be happier because their community will have that feel that they remember, that they cherish, rather than having battles over 20-story towers. But instead, you need to allow the next increment of housing by right in every neighborhood. And when we say by right, it means that you should be able to go into City Hall at 9 a.m. with a completed permit application and walk out by noon with a permit. Yeah, that ain't happening. It's possible. It is very possible, particularly if we understand that in a neighborhood, it's already set up for housing, it's already set up uh, to have sewer, it's already set up for all of these core things. If we put more housing in our housing lands, we can also preserve many of our environmentally sensitive areas or the places on the floodplains that we shouldn't even be building in, in the first place. You shouldn't have to go beg from commissions or do all kinds of public hearings or do public engagements to do simple, simple things. I said before, if my neighbor buys a new truck, I don't get to weigh in on. What about if my neighbor adds a backyard suite for his grandmother? Why do I suddenly have the obligation and the responsibility and, and the solemn duty to stand there and oppose it? And why am I listened to? By right, you should be allowed to build to the next increment of housing. It's, it's a simple thing. It doesn't mean huge leaps in density, but it does allow for additional households to be established. This is why the new trend uh, to legalize duplexes and accessory dwelling units or secondary suites as we talk about them in Delta and here, uh, modest apartments, courtyard cottages, those are so valuable. They're like filling in all of the missing gaps within existing neighborhoods. Vacant lots that are currently in my city reserved for single family homes and what do they put on there? Three million dollar houses. I'm like the last thing that we need is more three million dollar houses. People have choices at that income level, at that purchasing price, but they don't have options when it's much lower. And so what does the next, neighbor, next increment look like? If you live in a neighborhood that is exclusively single family homes, anticipate that the next increment looks like your neighborhood gradually evolving over the next generation into a neighborhood consisting of single family homes and duplexes. If it, it doesn't look like overwhelming amounts of growth. It looks like your neighbor slightly matures, slightly becomes more intense. We need to allow that by right, with minimal regulatory friction. And so we'd say at Strong Towns, and I would encourage you to adapt this for yourselves, that no neighborhood should experience radical change. There's a long history of saying, oh, that neighborhood is blighted. We're simply gonna wipe it away. You won't recognize it tomorrow. And that will be where we put all of our growth. That's where we're gonna put all of the activity and, and displace everybody that's there. We need to stop. But no neighborhood should become unrecognizable over a short period of time. You should be able to leave your neighborhood, come back in a decade, and still have it be broadly recognizable. Hopefully more mature, a better place to be, with a few more neighbors, not less. We're seeing a lot of our neighborhoods struggling to maintain their population densities as, as people are divorcing, as they're aging, as they're not having fewer children, as they're not moving out of their homes even when they're a single occupant, which I understand because oftentimes the choices that they have are very meager. I had an older woman in the congregation that I was pastoring in, and she said, I don't want to be in a box. I said, I want to build you a courtyard then. 
a cottage. I want, I want to build you something where you can garden. I want you to have the freedom to live in, in a backyard of somebody that will support you, but in your own space, not just in borrowed quarters. But when we put a neighborhood under glass, we, when we lock it in amber and say, it is done now, you can't change it, you, we kill it, it dies. It becomes trapped in a way that is unhealthy for us. That's why we say that every neighborhood uh, should experience change, but none should be subjected to radical change. It's because the growth that we need to happen uh, needs to happen within a set of parameters. It needs to be more than zero. It's gotta be greater than zero or else you get stagnation and the elimination of choices, but it also can't be cataclysmic growth that wrecks your local economics. And guess who does this best? Guess who does incremental development best? Your neighbor. The guy that works a shift and then builds a house on the side, a small house or a backyard cottage, or the woman that's finished trade school and is like, I've got some ideas. My uncle can loan me a little bit of money. I'm going to get my start. You know who doesn't do incremental development? None of the big builders out of Calgary. None of the big builders that are, are moving up from Houston or other places. And yet, what is the most difficult thing, as the mayor shared earlier, she said, incremental development is a thing that we want to see, but we're not yet seeing it. Well, then we need to remove those regulations, the burdens that are in the way, so that you can walk in at 9 a.m. with a ninth grade education and leave at noon with a permit to build what you need. And so we need to stop blocking the economic potential of neighborhoods. Think also of small stores. Economic incremental development applies to small retail, small stores as well. We have a Filipino market in, in Vancouver, a, a rented building next to a SkyTrain station. They got word, hey, you need to move out uh, because the SkyTrain parcels are so valuable now that we're going to stick up towers. So the Filipino community was quite troubled. Where are we going to stick the market? They went to the industrial park, quite a distance away, and it killed the market and it hurt the community. Meanwhile, right adjacent to all of the, the little commercial strip was a number of homes that could have easily been purchased and the ground floor could have been turned into that market or even a two-story market. Make it weird, make it funky, but make it work. But we don't allow it. And again, that doesn't worry Loblaws. That doesn't worry the big players. They're not interested. They don't operate at that scale. But that loss of that Filipino market, that loss of the ice cream manufacturer that's doing it in their garage, and then says, hey, there's a cute little shop just up the street, but oh shoot, it's zoned as a barber shop. Hasn't been a barber there for 10 years, but it's still zoned for that, and so I don't even think it's worth me starting. Uh, this morning, I heard a conversation with someone who was fully committed to starting a spa in a rented area, and had to wait months and months and months before finally getting approval for rezoning and, and the struggle, the burden that that created. And she persisted, but many more don't. Many more leave or simply resolve for themselves that there is no pathway. In strong towns, we tell stories all the time about the people that are making these types of decisions. We don't have to profile lob laws. We don't have to profile Canadian Tire. We tell stories about people that start small businesses and suddenly they're, they're investing in, in nearby structures and they're buying the building and inviting their friends to start a bike shop and start whatever it is that works best for their community. And when you do this, you're not dependent upon the outside world. When you do this, you're not waiting for the federal government to swoop in and incentivize your development on a greenfield site. When you do this work, you begin to restart like probiotics in your gut a system of local builders, local people taking action, young people. How do you get your start as a developer? Well, get your MBA, go to finance school, figure out Wall Street investment, whatever you gotta do, and then show up, ride in on a camel, not a camel, on a, on a, on a, in a Mustang, and make it happen. No, we need people that just say, I think I could build a shed that's suitable for someone to live in. Small quarters, but hey, we'll accept it. We need to move back into the system. And so this is part of what we talk about in terms of the traditional development pattern. In the traditional development pattern, a gradual investment in the neighborhood's services followed the gradual investment in its homes and properties. And it would follow and mirror the growing intensity of private investment. And so you see in this chart uh, on, the, on the lower part here, uh, you have the first action, 
uh, or pardon me, right here. You have the first action, build the train stop. So there's an initial private investment. We're going to make this place happen. They plan out the town. They basically identify very small parcels of land. Go check your zoning, all of your downtown, all of these little parcels. And probably wherever there's a bigger building, it used to be a smaller building. That was commonplace because it allowed people to make a small incremental investment and take a chance on building a home, building a storefront. And over time, they would be like, to improve our place and to prevent our stuff from burning, let's start a fire brigade. Then there would be additional private investment because people said, we can have confidence that this place is here for us. We can have confidence that this place is actually a good investment. So they would build more and that would prompt then, let's figure out something to do with the sewers. Let's figure out what to do with water. Uh, let's begin, and, and as you see, it begins this, this virtuous cycle of responding to the feedback of private investment. Now what we have done, and Canadian cities are doing this just as much as American cities, is we are simply saying, let's do all the private investment up front, the highway interchange, the run the utilities of the site, the frontage roads, uh, expand the water treatment system, and, and then we're gonna wait for everything else to emerge. This is out of the public purse without any of this contributing until you finally get to the end. And actually by the time you get the dollar store strip mall conversion, it's beginning to decline already. It has not realized its potential. Uh, the investors realize, oh, this is class B real estate. And they begin to move on to the next one. Uh, my brother, uh, I won't pick on Walmart too much, but my brother's a, a landscaper and he was chatting with a guy who was doing the roof of a new, brand new Walmart in my parents' neighborhood. And, and, and the guy was complaining, he said, yeah, I have to work with terrible materials. And Ryan was like, why are you doing that? I mean, it's a big store. And they said, they want a 20 year roof. That's the only amount of time that they're gonna spend here and then they're gone. They were already anticipating the decline of the neighborhood, even though all of the public investment had already taken place. The Walmart was hedging its bets because they, they don't have skin in the game. They're not participating in it. But a local business, a, a local person is not going to treat the community in the same way. And so all modern neighborhoods are built with sewer and water systems, all have police and fire, uh, and, and nearly all have modern amenities. But this is a feature of a, a trap that was sprung when the door, or when money flew out the door to build complete communities. And, and change is hard. The challenge is, is that there's generally no discernible benefit to adding residents in a community of the suburban experiment. Because it was just given to you. See, it was just over there. All the investment took place. And as a consequence, sewers and waters and all the rest are considered to just be base conditions of modern living, the, the ante we demand in an affluent modern society. Regardless of whether we can afford to sustain it, and we mostly can't, and the, the realization that once you're in this state, if everything has been built, then there is no benefit to adding more people. Now, does that ring a bell at all when you think of some of the housing challenges in your community? that people say in their neighborhood, there's no benefit to me of others moving in. Only havoc, only trouble. More people simply means more traffic congestion, more people at the park, longer lines at the library, no one wants that. It means that the green space I enjoy driving by will be turned into house, homes and strip malls. I don't want that. In some places it means neighborhoods becoming more expensive and long-term residents being pushed out. It means taxes going up to invest in growth in other parts of the city. And, and this was one of the questions that Chuck had had in the mid-2000s that ultimately led him to create strong towns. Why do taxes rise the fastest in cities growing the fastest? It seems contrary, doesn't it? Why, does, why were taxes, as he observed in municipality after municipality, the ones that were growing the fastest were ra having to raise their taxes to meet their base requirements? And he described that as a Ponzi scheme, one where the desperation of local government to get more growth is at odds with the rational response of residents to new growth. Okay, but just not in my backyard. And so this is our North Star. As our cities decline and experience tension, as frayed budgets cut back on what governments are capable of delivering, people need to be allowed uh, to turn their cities and towns and neighborhoods into stronger, more resilient and adaptable places. The disincentives for incremental development need to be removed. And we'll touch on those in a moment. And we need to allow all of our neighborhoods to not only grow incrementally, but to experience positive feedback as a result of that growth. And this is our way to turn the ship around, to reverse course, to escape a worsening cycle. And I should insist, this is the, the strong town's approach. 
Maybe just a comment too that the city of Medicine Hat, as it engages with strong towns, is not saying we have bought into all of this hook, line, and sinker, and, and, and this is what tomorrow looks like. But this is part of this pattern. This is what we are encouraging. This is what we are urging community leaders to take seriously, and they are. And to resolve through consultation within the community, what do we value? What do we want? What do we want to see for our community? And in particular, with respect to the addition of housing and finding greater diversity of housing choices, we need to be opening the door, as I said, to the next increment of housing, but doing so in perpetuity ideally at the local level, to unlock local opportunity and address local needs with integrity. We need to lower the bar of entry. We need to have an entry point for people that they can get into. Uh, how many of you would like to live in a 600 square foot house? Put up your hand. Yeah, a few of you. Now, how many of you have lived in a house that was about 600 square feet? That's right. So the very thing that we have availed ourselves of in the past is now no longer available and we wonder why kids these days are upset. We had a, ma a former mayor, she said, if you just weren't buying avocado toast and getting lattes, you'd be able to afford a house. And I said, these houses are $1.2 million. I think we did the calculations, it was five avocado toasts and 19 lattes a day that you'd have to cut back on a habit in order to be able to afford your down payment. Now, I mean, I'm at like six lattes a day, no. Um, it, it was one of those things where there was a generational difference, but we've changed the pattern and we removed these types of options. We need to lower the bar to entry. We need to lower the bar to entry because this is the building block of prosperity. And we've taken that first or that lower rung off and we've said uh, it's not possible to do. This is part of the challenge at a municipal level is that for compassionate reasons, we've said we need buildings to be habitable. And we've allowed our standard of what is habitable to slowly increase. Now it's almost to the point where places like California require solar panels on many new homes, but, but that doesn't help with the housing affordability problem. The result is that many people can't reach that high standard, and so their choice isn't a larger home in a small pop-up shack. It's either a large home or the streets. We've broken off that lowest rung of options, that lowest rung of prosperity. And as Chuck Marones points out in the places that he visits, well, we've raised the bar on entry-level products that you can't build a simple accommodation in a backyard and rent it out or share it with a family member. We've dramatically lowered the bar at the same time on the, on the mid-level product that we're building. Most single-family homes today are built of cheap, throwaway material that quickly falls apart once it reaches the end of its life cycle. And that applies not only to residential as well, but also to commercial construction where it's too expensive to tear down and replace, but it's too cheap to last. And so we have to lower the bar of entry. And what that looks like is allowing the next increment of housing within a community. It's legalizing a lot of the things that people turn their noses up because they say, I don't want to live in a 600 square foot house, even though in the past they have. It's allowing things like greater options for rentals within existing neighborhoods. Uh, there was a great conversation with someone uh, whose aunt said, oh, I just don't want any renters in my neighborhood. And he said, well, when you were in college, did you rent? She said, well, yeah. He said, would you have liked to have lived in this neighborhood? She said, hmm, point taken. When we consider where we begin, it helps us to see the needs that we have to lower the bar, allow many others to begin. And I say this particularly if you're in a, an, an older generation than I'm in. Do what you can to urge for a way for the bar of entry to be lowered, and you'll see remarkable things happen. You'll see remarkable things happen. You won't get more Canadian tires this way, but you will get more independent bike shops, small hardware stores. You'll begin to see the reintroduction of, of these small types of businesses. I, I met a business owner uh, yesterday and chatted with her today as well. And she sells like knickknacks and, and stuff that people are creating here. Uh, over on 4th Street. I think it's Elliot, which is my son's name, and that's where she's selling her wares. It's a store that, that somebody with an MBA would be like, well, the market share probably doesn't pencil out, but she's doing it because she can and because she's able to cultivate people within the community to share her stuff, to sell her stuff, uh, to come to the store, facing all of the challenges that come with being a downtown business owner, and yet being able to do so, having an opportunity in, and by doing so, cultivating a genuine investment within the community and not seeing all of the funds, all of the profits 
get sent to Calgary or Toronto or other places. Local investments with a low bar is a magical thing within a community. And critically, again, this is our North Star. That's the way it used to be. That's the way the traditional development pattern has existed throughout millennia. And only recently have we begun to really mess it up. And so I said one action uh, that moves us uh, towards our North Star of a traditional time-tested development pattern is to allow the next increment of development universally. Uh, here you can see it in a commercial setting. Uh, people rent them for the summer. Uh, this is Muskegon, Michigan. Maybe Chuck shared the slide as well. But I mean, the story is remarkable. I met the mayor there uh, in Muskegon a couple months ago. And he said, Norm, those things saved our downtown. He said, all of our buildings were dying. They couldn't find rents because they had to charge three, six, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month for the rents in the downtown buildings because they're slightly larger. But he said there was nobody coming up. They opened these and within six months, all of these tenants had gotten sufficient capital operating proof of concept that they could move into the downtown. And then a new batch came. And I, I, I deliberately, well actually, sadly, I drove down the street rather than walking down it and enjoying it. But critically, it was, it's just an incubator for those types of things. And whatever you need to do to adapt to what's happening with the sea cans, work at that, develop that, uh, find ways to make it more permanent. Not, doesn't have to be completely permanent, but more dressed up, more, more individualized, more character as you go along. Modest investments went into this. I think each shed was $20,000. That's not much, but it's created so much. And we need to do this. Uh, just a touch on allowing, again, the next increment by right. This is an encouragement. Secondary suites are a doubling of your potential housing stock, but also a profound way of providing new entry points for people within your community. And the thing is, that growth will be, feel almost undiscernible. You will not feel the sudden increase in population and the increase in students of being able to afford to live here, increase in small business owners finding a place that works for them or, or parents being reunited with their children. Uh, those types of things will happen within existing neighborhoods in ways that, that what I like to call sort of imperceptible housing. Imperceptible housing, not, not the big track development that, that takes out your favorite hill. But you can double the density of your community so rapidly just by allowing things like accessory dwelling units or backyard suites, garage conversions, or basements uh, being turned into homes for people. Uh, another way to do this is through the zoning bylaws, a look at minimum lower lot sizes. Minimum lot sizes uh, force homes uh, to consume more land than re residents might otherwise want to. Remember the, the slide that I showed you from, from Grand Rapids, where they're using all of the land that they have, but they didn't have that much land to begin with. And since land is such a major cost in building a home, a large minimum lot size can substantially increase the cost of housing. Allow residential development in commercial zones and allow commercial uses in residential neighborhoods. That's part of this increment, this thickening up of neighborhoods. This one's for the city. Speed up the discretionary re review process. Discern which things you don't need to review. That's a huge way to save, uh, save on not only on staff time, but also processing time, uh, streamlining those things, cutting out unnecessary review for small compliant proposals, and allowing way more to be developed as of right. And again, this is not the City of Medicine Hat's proposal. This is what Strong Towns encourages cities across North America to be doing. I started with Tim's question about how we became so wasteful in the way that we build, and particularly in how we spend public dollars but also to understand how is it that people, private businesses are, are building in ways that seem to squander opportunity and squander wealth and squander land in many ways. And, and what do we need to do? We need to learn where the value in our community truly comes from. And we need to focus our improvements in these areas uh, to cultivate deeper roots, greater prosperity, and improved economic and community resiliency. And so just in about five minutes here, before we wrap, I'm gonna show you this, these numbers. I ran the numbers in Medicine Hat to compare a number of downtown uh, commercial properties uh, with their suburban cousins. Uh, these were the different sites that I looked at. If I'd had more time, I would have taken even more on. And I did what's called a value per acre analysis. I, I couldn't get the property tax uh, data as a cold alien, so I looked up uh, just the current assessed value of a handful of properties uh, to see what their general capacity to be a reservoir of private investment is. 
That's a, a one way to think of the value or the assessed value of any given property. It's basically how much money can be stored within that property. So if your home is worth $5 million, that means you have $5 million stored there. If the market goes up or goes down, it changes. But roughly, that's a proxy for how valuable it is, but also how useful it can be to you for productive purposes. For a city, a $5 million property generates a greater tax benefit than a $1 million property. It's just as when you go to the mortgage, get a mortgage, that $1 million home is not going to get you uh, as much borrowing capacity as a $5 million home. So if we have this, as we think of uh, value as, as a reservoir of private investment and a reliable source of property tax revenues, I want to show you the sites that I looked at. I started with the Salvation Army building on uh, 3rd Street. It's 0 0.3 acres with a fairly low assessed value for the downtown of 543400 it's an older building. Uh, it has limited occupancy, uh, renting it to a nonprofit, and one that isn't able to plow lots of money into improvements in the building means that its, its assessed value continues to be fairly low. If I standardize the assessed value to see what its value is per acre, it comes out to $1.8 million. Maybe just to quickly explain why. If we took three vehicles, one a big truck, and two a Mazda Miata, and three a smart car, and said, which one can drive the furthest? The truck would win, because it's got the biggest gas tank. But if we standardize this, we say, which one has the best fuel mileage? That one, that is, which one gives you the best bang for buck? The truck might struggle against the Miata or the smart car. And so that's what we're doing here. We're basically, this is like the miles per gallon is the values per acre, or kilometers per liter, but I've never figured that one out. I'm Canadian. I still don't use it. And that's why we're using acres. I noticed Chuck, when he was here in January, he's like, all oh, hectares, and he couldn't figure out how to pronounce it. I was like, we don't use hectares ourselves, but the city has to, I think, at times. But 1.8 million. So remember that number. A couple doors over on 3rd Street uh, is this building. She ain't very pretty, but she's functional. Currently looking for multiple tenants. You can see in the, the signs in the window, several of the bays are vacant but still holding a lot of value on two floors with numerous businesses and retailers being incubated within uh, these walls. And the value is $4.9 million an acre. Just by adding a second functional floor and the capacity to use the building more extensively, as well as in, in the improved condition of the building, makes it a far more valuable property. And now my favorite. I really should go get something there. Sugar Daddy Cheesecakes. Again, two stories, very simple structure, possibly residential on the second floor or some type of office space up there. They're, they have to provide AC, so I'm assuming somebody's up there. $5.2 million an acre. And this is the downtown. So this is our baseline. This is the downtown that, as I'm told, is struggling to keep tenants. There's turnover. Businesses are turning over all the time. And yet, it is a remarkable reservoir of wealth and opportunity, a place for many to get their start and for others to finish their careers. And then across the street, still on 3rd Street, uh, you can see the Sugar Daddy's building is just right over here with a fantastic mural. Now you have a new style of building. I said there was a change in the development pattern. Uh, this is a good example of this. It's pushed away from the street. It's pushed away and up, and, it, and it's creating some distance from the place. This could actually be just dropped into a parking lot. And most of the designs like that in Lethbridge, for example, in Mayor McGrath, uh, looks just like that, but it's just plunked into the middle of a parking lot. But this one, because it's in the downtown area, probably had to uh, accord to some of the zoning, and so it didn't have the big parking lot attached to it, but it's built in this suburban style. And this new style, less effective use of land. And I'm going to tip you off to a theme. The values are going to start dropping as the built form begins to tip into the newer suburban style of development with its ample setbacks and withdrawn frontage. These are like luxury vehicles compared to what we're going to see. And yet the new things, the shiny things, we assume, no, 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 those are the ones that hold the value. But this is 4.4 million. Now, three streets over on a lot that is set way off the road, uh, but it still has a patio, which is good. Uh, we're back down to $1.8 million an acre. This is a site that is double the size of the old and tired Salvation Army. But somehow, it cannot use that space any more efficiently and leaks value because of two things. The deep discounting that it receives for surface parking on site from the assessor, which is a massive subsidy for parking, and 
the degradation of the street frontage. This is no longer a great place to walk. It's not a suitable place uh, for children to walk unaided. It's not a great place uh, for a child to pass through on a bicycle. There's a considerable gap there that they need to navigate, and that becomes a barrier for so many. But then, a few more blocks away, uh, the development pattern is very different. Notice the value. This is a newer building, so it should have greater value. It's on a prominent frontage. The city has invested a lot in improving the streets, uh, there's the red pavers, there's the stamped concrete, uh, there's uh, an excuse for a flower bed. Um, there's no street trees, so that, that's a miss, but there's an opportunity there, and yet it's only $1.6 million an acre. And it's a site that is hard to improve as it currently exists. Now, I ask the question, how does the sugar daddy feel uh, that he's contributing three times as much property tax to the city while having half the amount of street frontage for the city to keep up and providing a much better public experience out front of his establishment, being taxed significantly more while providing far more public benefit without requiring as much public infrastructure. Is this Tim so valuable that it deserves to be taxed only one third as much as sugar daddies? In my community of Delta, British Columbia, it's even more stark. We have a coffee shop with a counseling office above it that pays seven times the amount of property tax that the local McDonald's on the most prominent street at the entrance to our town does. And I always ask, sure, we can enjoy the convenience of a drive through and the culinary masterpiece that is the Bacon McGriddle, but is it really worth it for us to levy taxes on the coffee shop that are proportionally seven times higher than we levy on the McDonald's if we adjust for the amount of scarce land that we're, they're both taking up? Is that what we've collectively decided that we, the citizens, value most? At some point, if it was a one to two, you know, you get 50% of the tax revenue from the McDonald's, but it's nice to have it. But at some point, when this sliding scale goes down, do we really think that a one-seventh discount is exactly what we want to be providing to a company that takes our profits and takes them overseas? And again, I'm not, I'm not waging class war, or economic warfare, or anything like that. I'm just asking the question, what do we value as a community? Uh, that double-double at Tim's doesn't taste quite so nice. Well, it never did. But uh, if you know that the city is leaving remarkable amounts of money on the table by mandating design standards that result in more Tim's and make it nearly impossible to build structures like the Salvation Army building, if you must, or the more productive ones, like the small retail and office building I showed you and Sugar Daddy's. But Tim's and Days are, uh, are just older, right? And that's maybe why they're getting a discounted valuation. But let's look at a new development along two major corridors uh, so that, that the city has invested millions of dollars to construct and maintain so that this seven acre site can be accessed uh, by all y'all in need of pet care and ATB, a liquor store, Rubens Veggies, and more Tim Hortons. Three public access points run onto and off the major roads there. And this site is the most valuable one that we're looking at in my series of examples if we just look at how big the tank on this machine is. $14 million. That's great, right? Well, its value is $1.9 million an acre. 7.3 acres divided by 14 million is $1.9 million an acre. It's at days off pub value. But this is in its newest state. This is what the financial masterminds in Toronto and other places say, every community should get one of these. But it's not performing well. And this is in its finished state when it first still has the gloss and before the dollar store and the Halloween store have moved in as the other tenants have left. After significant public investment, and the vast majority of your downtown is worth more on a comparative basis, where does the public think the value in the city lies? In the downtown, most think of it as an afterthought, a place they avoid. Might we begin to see these places as gold mines instead? I've been using the phrase, where's the money pot and where's the money pit? The money pot is downtown. The money pot is in these more, slightly more compact neighborhoods and the consequences are a vast increase in the capacity of those neighborhoods and those places to generate the wealth that is needed to be able to provide for basic services in the community. And can we see how then, and this is the exciting part, what do we do? Modest investments in downtown, like improved sidewalks, 
safer crosswalks with curb bump outs to improve the pedestrian experience, street lighting and public art, commitments to greater resources being provided to address those who are poorly housed or unhoused. These are all things that as you do them, they will cause the value captured and stored in the downtown to escalate significantly. It is amazing what little interventions in these high value areas are capable of, particularly because for decades, these places were underinvested in, and yet they still hold way more value than this. The seven acre site I'm looking at is newly built and already returning a value that is basically comparable to the Salvation Army building that is one of the lowest performers on Third Street. Now, a challenge is how do you improve the Division Street parcel, this one, to gain enough value to match the old but well-beloved Sugar Daddy's building? One of these has had national, if not international, financing backing, uh, backing up its uh, construction, and it wasn't the Sugar Daddy. This is what it looks like uh, as a question. How do we improve a $14 million property in its finished state to be as valuable or comparable to a $37.4 million one? I so said there's a promise of a local path. Uh, this is in Memphis, Tennessee. It's a great example of what we call a chaotic but smart approach to city building. Uh, this little street is called Broad Avenue. Uh, some residents who were fed up with the neglect went and took matters into their own hands. Uh, they worked with store owners uh, to get everything swept up and cleaned up. And you're working hard at this. I see this in the downtown area. They went out, they painted their own bike lanes and crosswalks. And they invited for one weekend businesses to come in and open up in vacant storefronts. Rather than leaving them dark when there was a festival in town, they just said to the landlords, we're moving in. Uh, we're going to set something up in, in your parcel. We're going to ask somebody with a business, hey, show up in the downtown when we do the chili cook-off, which is coming up. And it sounds really amazing. They had a couple of art galleries, a bike shop, a clothier show up. Uh, they didn't go get city permission. They actually said, by the time anybody gets angry with us, we're going to be long gone. So let's just do this. And it actually made the street a nice place. This isn't the great street in Memphis. It's not the place of great prominence, but it's a lot better than what was there before. And Chuck went to visit there just six months later, and every single storefront was occupied by a business. Think, these are modest investments in this place, and it made a major difference. And suddenly, they were able to charge uh, even twice the amount of rent for the last place to go compared to with what they were asking before any of this happened. And the city has since gone out and documented 18 new businesses, 32 new jobs, 12 million in property value appreciation, and the total public investment was zero. This is chaotic but smart. Now, I don't know what Medicine Hat would do if you went out and started painting crosswalks, but I know exactly what my city would do. Uh, we have no tolerance for this type of chaos. Monday morning, the work crews and the engineers uh, and the city attorney would be out there and they'd be holding the manual with their standards for crosswalks and the sol city solicitor would be directing them to get the power washers out uh, to get rid of it before we have a problem. And they'd be saying, this is not in our plan, so we certainly can't be doing this here. Now, this is not medicine hat. You guys have way better public leaders. Uh, mine, they can't even place a picnic table at an ice cream shop. That, that's a whole other story. But, but what about in Memphis? In Memphis, they were smart. They realized we're in a certain desperate situation where a lot of our properties are underperforming. We need to fix them fast. And so they said, let's do small, modest investments in the public realm, and we're going to see what happens in the private realm. And it was the citizens that did this first. And this is a challenge, not to necessarily go out and change everything in your community without anyone's permission, but to see and to take interest and to talk together with a local conversation group that's forming here in the city and with other groups, but to take action to recognize how can we improve this place? Because what we have is this. We have cities that are not very productive, places that are struggling, uh, where we don't make great use of the stuff that we have. But we still have the good bones, we still have the structure, we still have the opportunities to build here. And the cities that we built today, the model that we've built them in is a bad business model. It doesn't work, and it doesn't work for people. We've all maybe found a niche way to make it work, but I walk around and I'm, I'm troubled by what I see because it could be so much better. We don't lack the money. We don't lack the resources. We, we don't lack the capacity, the creative interests of so many people. But the current system makes us feel like we do, but we don't. And so we can turn this around. We can reorient ourselves reorient the way that we think about these issues and create these complex feedback loops. 
And at the end of the day, try to spend a little less, get more and live better lives. Uh, that's what Strong Towns is about. And that's what I genuinely hope you'll see continue to emerge within your community. Uh, rallying around one another, trying to figure out how do we do the next smallest thing? For you, what is that next smallest thing? That'll be one of the discussion questions we could take up now. What can we do? How can Strong Towns learn from what you are observing? Share with us. Be wonderful. That's part of this process. But at the same time, share with you in your community. Share within other conversations that are taking place. And so I want to highlight Caleb as well as Catherine. Catherine at the back. Uh, and they have both volunteered to be uh, part of the steering committee for a local conversation group. This is one of the things that we are seeing pop up in all sorts of different places. There's just people meeting up for coffee uh, to chat about local issues uh, without a particular sort of constituency. They're not business owners or they're not uh, people that like pickleball. Uh, they're, they're people with lots of different interests. And that's one of the wonderful things that we've been seeing. And so they would love to have additional people participate in the conversations or else they may get tired of each other. Uh, they've just met. But at the same time, they're starting these conversations. And if you are able to or interested, definitely uh, participate in that as well. But then I'll close. I know I've gone long. My apologies. Um, but I believe that this is such a critical part of what we can do, not only here in Medicine Hat, uh, but in communities across Alberta, Canada, and uh, around the world. So thank you very much.